Welcome to at Cronkite News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Let's get a refresh on the top Arizona news of the week. Earlier this year, the Cronkite News Heroin Project exposed the recent epidemic of heroin use across the state. A national survey just last year said heroin use in women between the ages of 15 and 44 jumped from 83,000 in 2012 to 109,000 in 2014. Even more troubling is that some of those women are using heroin and other illicit drugs while pregnant. Every day, Dr. Nathan Lepp treats babies in neonatal intensive care units across Phoenix. Some of them are unwillingly addicted to drugs. This is a burgeoning epidemic that really has just happened in the last, oh, five to eight years that all of us who take care of babies are just now really uh, dealing with every day. According to the Department of Health Services in Arizona, the rate of newborns exposed to narcotics has increased more than 218 percent since 2009. Christy Arthur was pregnant, addicted to meth and unable to stay sober. That's when she turned to a recovery program for addicted pregnant women in Phoenix. Honestly, I came in because I wanted to just stay sober long enough to have my baby. Dana Neves, also addicted to meth, checked in at the same time. She didn't know where else to turn. I never wanted to be pregnant and use a substance. I, I never thought I would be that kind of a person. Angela Phillips with Community Bridges Center for Hope works closely with these women and sees the emotional toll. They feel that they've hurt their baby, they, their baby's gonna come out with problems and it's all their faults and now they're fighting not only their previous problems and concerns that possibly started their addiction, but now the concerns of what have I done to my baby. The women are put on special treatments to kick the addiction. Common detox drugs include methadone, buprenorphine, subutex, and suboxone. The Center for Hope uses a methadone treatment program, but that doesn't alleviate the risk of the infant enduring withdrawal symptoms. A lot of the women who are on methadone and they go to give birth to their baby, their baby's going to experience withdrawals. When babies are born with neonatal abstinence syndrome, they end up in the NICU where they can remain for an extended period of time. In a baby, we're looking for signs and symptoms that include um, inconsolable crying, vomiting, diarrhea, um, shaking. It can even go so bad as to be seizures. But neonatal absence syndrome is not the only risk these newborns face. There's really lifelong effects that can affect the child um, after delivery. So things, uh, things like cognitive delays or developmental delays, social delays, behavioral problems. Arthur, a mother of six, experienced the devastating effects on her children. I mean, there's a lot of factors that will say, yes, my kids did have side effects from my using. Arthur says she's put the past behind her. I'm in a good place. I've been sober for nine years. January will be, will be 10 for me. Um, I have a really good job. I have a stable house. Um, I'm married. Um, my kids know that I'll be home at night. And so has Neves. I now have my bachelor's degree. Um, I'm a director <laughs> in the position that I work in. I cleaned up my credit, I bought a house, I got married. So now I have, you know, the traditional family, the mom, the dad, the three kids, three dogs. According to the 2014 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, over 120,000 women admitted to using some type of illicit drug while pregnant. For a full multimedia report, visit cronkitenews.azpbs.org. It's one of the most controversial topics of our time, pitting believers and deniers against each other. But in the past few months, the U.S. has seen near record highs in the percentage of Americans who believe there's strong evidence of global warming. I think there's very strong evidence, and I've actually thought that way for many, many years. Larky Hodges is in agreement with most of the country when it comes to views on global warming. According to the National Surveys on Energy and the Environment, 70% of Americans say they believe in global warming, up 10% from this time last year, and just behind the record 72% in 2008. Based on the how compelling the science is, how people are seeing 
things, whether it's you know drought or extreme weather, they see on a worldwide basis that this is an issue that people are concerned about. The survey asked respondents to indicate which factors had a very large effect on their beliefs. The top three categories were severe drought, diminishing glaciers, and extreme weather events. State climatologist Dr. Nancy Sellover says even though we are in a 21-year dry period, these factors aren't a sure sign. The longest drought that we know about lasted almost 60 years, and it was 800 or so years ago. We didn't have an increased amount of carbon at that point in time, so we can't necessarily blame it on that. So it's really hard to try and pin any particular weather event on a, on a larger scale long-term climate situation. Sellover says noticeable weather changes might still be a long way off. We are seeing not necessarily evidence of extreme events, but continuously warmer temperatures. In looking toward the future, Hodges says this is an issue that requires everyone's support. People just have to look past the partisan politics and say what's best for me and my children. Barr says the survey was released at a perfect time, just a few months before the World Climate Summit in Paris this December. The pilots of American Airlines Flight 563 from Phoenix were temporarily blinded last night. A laser was flashed into their cockpit as pilots attempted to land near San Diego. Shining these lasers is becoming a more common now, and Cronkite News reporter Mitch Casada was in Phoenix, where he, where he learned about more about these dangers of the lasers. Well, when used properly, lasers can be very beneficial. They can correct eye vision and they can help with a variety of other surgeries as well. But when they're pointed at airplanes, especially those in the air, that's when they can become dangerous, sometimes even deadly. They are bright and distracting. Lasers pointed at airplanes are becoming a common problem and increasingly dangerous. You can cause permanent eye damage, which would end the pilot's career. Um, and, and when people are shining lasers on an airplane that's coming into land, you're endangering uh, potentially several hundred lives all at once. That was the case Tuesday night when American Airlines Flight 563 from Phoenix was five minutes from landing in San Diego. Suddenly, laser lights lit up the cockpit. No one was injured, but passengers at Sky Harbor Airport are concerned. Flying, I think, can always be stressful, so to add any uh, anything that is out of the norm to that experience can, I feel like would be a bad experience. While there are accounts of people pointing the lasers as harmless pranks, the FBI doesn't think it's funny. It's a federal crime punishable by five to 20 years in prison, and Kali thinks that's justified. And if you're endangering several hundred lives at a time, then you, you shouldn't be going to prison for that. And there's really no excuse to do that. People know that you shouldn't be doing something like that. So, you know, five years, Nobody's hurt. Okay, you know, that's probably a good enough punishment. I says nearly 4,000 laser strikes have been reported in the United States just this year. Reporting from downtown Phoenix, Mitch Casada, Cronkite News. It's a new step in sustainability. The city of Phoenix wants to turn trash into art, and it's looking for artists to find beauty and waste. Cronkite News reporter Eleni Dow takes a look into the program. As many as three artists will be will be placed at a transfer station on Lower Buckeye and 27th Avenue. There are endless possibilities when pairing an artist with a load of trash that they can use. Local artist Beth Shook collects furniture parts to create her artwork. My work is about a narrative and about a story, and we talk about seeing things differently, and every piece of furniture had a story. And to incorporate that, that story into my story is part of why I use it again. Recycling and reusing materials is the goal for the Artist in Residency pilot project, part of the Reimagine Phoenix initiative. So the hope with this project is that artists can add another layer to that conversation by showing what's possible, that cardboard is in fact paper and can be used. The artists in residency have four months to go through all of this trash and create artwork with what they find. I'll come to the studio and there will be you know, bedposts leaning up against my door someone was going to throw away. Another man's trash is an artist's treasure. The artists will have a large supply of different materials they can pick up from the waste transfer station. Typically on, on an average day we'll see um, uh, cardboard, plastics, tires, uh, all kinds of metal, uh, a lot of garbage. Shook would be happy to live next to a lumber yard for wood or a place that would give her endless supplies. It would be exciting to be able to have that resource you know, to always know I have this resource because it's amazing what sparks an idea 
You know, when you pick something up and you see the edge of a curve and you think, oh my gosh, and it sparks this idea, the inspiration to move on and the motivation to create. Following Saturday's Missing in Arizona Day, 22 new cases were reported, and one was even solved. This event helped people find new answers about their missing loved ones, but there are many more out there who are, have been waiting years for a new lead. She was, um, she was funny. Kimber Biggs, now 26, was just nine years old when her sister disappeared. I don't remember a lot of it. She was riding my bike and I was walking our dog. And I got cold and tired of waiting for the ice cream truck that she thought she heard. So I went inside and you know, walked back to the house and she was out there for a minute or two by herself. In that, I mean, 90 seconds that I walked down to the house, opened the door and told my mom and then walked back out to the street, you know, she was gone. I'm very sure that, that this is going to come to a quick and good end. Mikkel's case didn't have the ending her family hoped and it is now a cold case. She's been missing for almost 17 years. It really affected me because I feel like I missed out on my childhood. And um, in all honesty, I almost feel selfish for saying that because it's Mikkel who really missed out on it. It's worse than somebody dying in your family. When somebody dies, you, we have process, we have a ritual that we go through as human beings to, to deal with that. These families are denied that. The Biggs family decided to lay Mikkel to rest on the fifth anniversary of her disappearance. I don't know exactly who took her. I don't know what happened to her. I don't know where her body is. I can't, I mean, I go visit her grave, but I can't go to her grave and feel like that she is there. I mean, it's, an, it's empty. Kimber and other families with missing loved ones attended Missing in Arizona Day hoping to make a break in the case. Right now, it's just a matter of finding some things, a, a certain tip or a certain fact that someone knows that they need to come forward with for us to be able to move forward. The Missing Persons Unit for Phoenix Police says that the most missing persons cases aren't due to foul play. And Detective Summershoe says that they plan to hold the second annual Missing in Arizona Day next year in hopes of helping more struggling families. Angie Schuster, Cronkite News. As part of our continuing commitment to track heroin's hold on Arizona, Cronkite News has been examining the state's major drug trafficking routes and what law enforcement officials are doing to stop smugglers. Cronkite News reporter Sunny Scott looks at efforts in Pinal County, a major drug corridor. A 2015 intelligence report from the Drug Enforcement Administration says western states like Arizona continue to be primary transit areas, and even more traffickers are moving their operations into suburban and rural areas like Maricopa and Pinal County. From one end of Arizona's vast desert landscape to another, drug smugglers continue to move more heroin and methamphetamine than they ever have right into the hands of drug dealers and addicts. <laughs> Law enforcement authorities are patrolling Arizona to stop it. And Pinal County is on the front lines of the fight. It seems that over the past couple of years, it's really picked up just from what you see and what you hear. Chris Platt, a detective with the anti-smuggling unit in Pinal County, spends his days with other detectives doing smuggling-based investigations and drug interdictions on Interstates 8 and 10. Here in Pinal County, drug traffickers sometimes call 911 to report a fake accident to divert law enforcement agencies from the drug routes, just like here on Interstate 10 towards Phoenix. We're dealing with uh, more, more of the aspect when it gets picked up from already traveling through the desert on one of the interstates and then it's going through Pinal County up to Phoenix. Numbers obtained by Cronkite News from the Phoenix Division of the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration show more than 576 kilograms of heroin were seized this year. That's up from 163 kilograms found in 2010. This year, over 2,900 kilograms of meth were seized compared to 730 in 2010. Pinal County borders Mexico and it also uh, encompasses the Tejano Odom Indian Reservation, which is sparsely populated, uh, creates a, a lot of opportunity for the Mexican cartels to exploit that vast desert area to bring the, the drugs into the country. After traveling up north through Interstate 10, Phoenix becomes the hub of distribution for other U.S. cities. We see a vast majority of the drugs being smuggled uh, through the Midwest and in the states and cities there. 
These headlines document the scope of the problem from Idaho to Texas, North Dakota to Indiana and all across the southeastern United States. We're starting to see the Mexican um, heroin going into the north, northeast and the Midwest, which are the primary markets for heroin. The Arizona high intensity drug trafficking area brings various law enforcement agencies together to work as a force. Hyde is doing a couple different things. Our enforcement initiatives, our task forces are concentrating on heroin, um, doing the investigations and trying to put the bad guys in jail. They'll slip it over their shoes and tie them around them. You know, the carpet makes it tough to track. Platt's main goal is to stop the deadly drugs as they move through Pinal County and the rest of the country, keeping heroin and meth out of the hands of smugglers and addicts. Deaths involving heroin overdoses are rising in the state according to the Arizona Department of Health Services. Fewer than 50 people died in 2004 compared to nearly 200 people in 2014. With the investigative team, I'm Sonny Scott, Cronkite News. Scientists have been stumped for decades as why elephants rarely get cancer. Now, a new discovery with a link to ASU may have the answer. Cronkite News reporter Lauren Michaels is at the Phoenix Zoo to explain what this could mean to prevent humans from getting cancer. This is Sheena. She's a 43-year-old Asian elephant. Her and her entire kind have a 5% mortality rate linked to cancer. That's half the rate that humans do. And now scientists think they've discovered why. You ate it all. Yes, you did. Heather Wright, the elephant manager at the Phoenix oh. Zoo, has been working with Asian elephants for more than 15 years. And they're just amazing. I don't know if you call them spiritual, but you just look into their eyes and there's something deep going on in there. But what Wright didn't know was that Sheena has a cancer prevention gene that's inside all elephants. Carlo Maley, an associate professor at ASU Biodesign Institute, worked with a team on the groundbreaking discovery. And what we found was that they have many extra copies of a tumor suppressor gene. So there's a gene in the genome that one of its functions is to prevent cancer. It's called P53. Humans have only one copy of this gene. Elephants have at least 40. Once the gene detects a risk of cancer in a cell, it kills off the cell right away before any tumor has a chance to grow. So this is really exciting to us. It means every large organism out there has a key to preventing cancer and there's just discoveries waiting to be made. Maylee's team of scientists will continue to work on this study and with elephants to further the research. As for right, she continues to work with Sheena, knowing that there's much more than meets the eye. I love her, she loves me, and it's, so it's been definitely been worth it. It's a fun bond to have. All the experts involved in the study do say that the elephant gene discovery may take a little while to translate into the human research. In fact, they're moving on to even bigger mammals, the humpback whale. Here at the Phoenix Zoo, I'm Lauren Michaels, Cronkite News. <laughs> The multi-billion dollar marijuana industry found a home in Arizona this week with the Southwest Cannabis Conference take, taking place in downtown Phoenix. With 300 booths exhibiting all types of marijuana operations, job seekers were quick to get in on the action. Walk into the Southwest Cannabis Conference and the first thing you see is a Volkswagen blowing out smoke. But the people are here for business, like Liberty Wester, a culinary student hoping to find a job. Um, I've been picking up a lot of business cards from different dispensaries in the area that make a lot of chocolates and stuff like that because I'd like to be a chocolatier. She's looking for jobs specifically in Arizona, knowing that job prospects are slimmer here because our state doesn't allow recreational use. It's a little more difficult to think about even trying to be a cannabis chef because it's it's specific product and like that product isn't legal. But the pot industry continues to grow even in medical marijuana states like Arizona. Whether it goes adult use or even if it stays medical cannabis, people are still opening up more businesses to service collectives, to service dispensaries. But the marijuana job market doesn't limit itself to growers and dispensaries who work directly with the product. Hector Santa Cruz with THC Jobs, a cannabis staffing company, says jobs supplementing the industry make up a larger part of the job market. 70% of the jobs that we have in this industry are all these ancillary businesses, whether it's um, marketing companies, branding companies, packaging companies. But the competitive market isn't stopping Liberty. I've always wanted to be a chef and it just seems like the right idea to try to help people while doing what I love too. If she doesn't get the sweet job offer she's looking for, the aspiring chocolatier says she's moving to Colorado. 
The Southwest Cannabis Conference wraps up this evening after a job fair on Monday and a series of lectures catered to anyone doing anything in the cannabis industry. And food prices are on the rise in Arizona. According to a survey by the Arizona Farm Bureau, the cost of 16 basic grocery items was $54.57, up about $3.69 from just three months ago. Jesse Schultz found out what is behind, the, behind this hike. If it's not on sale, I'm not going to buy it. That is Ann Coover's philosophy. As a mom of three kids, she recognizes the rise in Arizona food prices. I do feel that groceries in general have gone up. She's right. The Arizona Farm Bureau reports that in the third quarter of 2015, food prices have risen six and a half percent. For us at Arizona Farm Bureau looking at it, we kind of said, wow, that's quite the increase. Beef saw the biggest price increase. Sirloin up $1.67 to $7.65 a pound. Other foods that increased were salad mixes, apples, deli meats, chicken breasts, and cheese. The reason for the high price of beef is basic economics, low supply. We're still feeling the effects of the drought last year, which significantly cut down the size of the herds. So the price of beef has continued to go up. Coover is proactive about finding the best deal. So I look and see who has, you know, the best prices. I usually go to three or four stores. Families like the Coovers can manage the increase, but those who can't are lower income families. St. Mary's Food Bank watches the food prices as well for the families that need their help. They don't have the extra money to spend on food. So um, everything that they are not able to get they're going to turn around and come to food banks to try to receive. Coover says no matter the price, she's always sure she can get a deal. Don't go to the store hungry. Don't go to the store without a list. And try to do the best that you can to meal plan. Another tip, clip those coupons and watch the ads. In Phoenix, Jesse Schultz, Cronkite News. If you want to brush up on your math skills or even master the latest video game, reporter Jackie Padilla found a local company that offers lessons for a wide variety of subjects. Avid Brain is a local tutoring agency that's branching out from the classroom. The company started this year and already has over 1,600 tutors. From English and history to roller skating and poker, students have the opportunity to learn just about anything. Tutoring agency based in Scottsdale. Owner and former college professor Keith Resendez says it's a system that targets a variety of student needs. We're going to focus on academic because that's my background. Uh, a lot of test prep, a lot of academic uh, from K-12 to college classes. However, we already have a lot of range from gameplay, Yiddish, just name it. Anything you can teach as a skill, we have it on our system. You heard right, Yiddish. There are even tutors to help up your game in World of Warcraft. For Tamara Allen, working with students on any given subject isn't just a part-time gig. I mean, I've been tutoring for over 10 years now, and I find that with experience, you just become more desirable as a tutor because people see that experience and they equate it with expertise. Students can take in-person lessons, but the agency offers online sessions that it believes can be just as effective. Technology allows students and tutors to interact with typical classroom tools, much like a whiteboard, all while using a computer. When it comes to making money, Avid Brain says new instructors set their price and pocket 70%, and that payout can increase over time. To be able to do what you love and make a decent living at it is really kind of priceless. Resendez says his next goal is to globally expand this educational network. Avid Brain doesn't require its tutors to have a degree, but does require a background check on all applicants before making them accessible to students. In the Broadcast Center, Jackie Padilla, Cronkite News. Now, here's an at Cronkite News pick of the week, a favorite from the Cronkite News staff. Bats have gotten a bad reputation as one of the things that go bump in the night, but Bat Week is here to change that. Elizabeth Blackburn reports. Bat Week brings together government agencies and private organizations to help bring more awareness about these winged mammals. Um, bats are not blind. They're not going to get stuck in your hair. They're not going to drink your blood. Uh, bats are, are actually very intelligent animals. Bats are actually important around the world, says Jonathan Reichard with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, partially because of what they eat. You eat a 
huge amount of insects, and so having them in our ecosystems is really important. They help balance the healthy ecosystems, maintain healthy forests and wetlands. The experts said that without bats eating insects, our food cost would likely be higher and air quality lower. Corn and cucumbers and peaches and anything you can imagine that we eat, in, that some insect eats too, and a lot of those insects have a night flying part of their life cycle. And Rob Mai says Arizona has the highest species diversity of bats of all of the states. There's insect eaters, there's bats that eat uh, scorpions, uh, they're called the pallid bat. Um, there's also nectar uh, feeders as well. So they come uh, to uh, cactus at night uh, and uh, pollinate. Despite all the good bats do, Leslie Sturgis says bats have a PR problem. There's really no, nothing a bat can do to you and just leave them be and enjoy the fact they're out there all night long, flying around, these tiny animals flying around in the night sky just eating insects like helping us and they don't even know it and we need to appreciate that. Reporting in DC, I'm Elizabeth Blackburn, Cronkite News. Cronkite News tracks your likes, tweets and shares from all our social sites to bring you this news special at Cronkite News, our weekly refresh. Join the conversation so you choose the news. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube and log on to cronkitenews.azpbs.org for top Arizona stories anytime. Your favorite PBS shows, ready to watch when you are. Anytime, any place. Find more ways to explore than ever before. Eight is Arizona PBS, a service of Arizona State University.